So, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this talk. Uh, in this presentation, I will talk about uh, regret lower bounds in bulk yarn bandits and reinforcement learning. And uh, I am affiliated to the Department of Automatic Control, School of uh, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, KTH Royal Institute of Technology. So to motivate uh, the context of this talk, let me just start with this fact that many tasks in real life are online sequential decision making tasks, and uh, these are typically fall in the framework of reinforcement learning. So, as some examples, we can uh, mention portfolio optimization, uh, the case of selling or buying an asset, uh, the case of making uh, a robot work, as an example in the field of robotics. Uh, play computer games, inventory management, routing in networks, all of these are examples of sequential decision making or sequential allocation problems that fall in the framework of reinforcement learning. So maybe it's a good idea to cast a general setup of this online decision making. So we consider a slotted time system uh, where at each state t Basically, a decision maker observes an state S of T. Then she chooses an action A of T from a given action set A cap. And then uh, to choose this action, she basically follows a policy function, which is just a mapping that uh, maps the history uh, of information that she has received so far to the set of actions. This means that basically uh, the action chosen a time t a of t is a function phi that could be a function uh, time varying function that takes as an input the sequence of a state action reward a state action reward up until time t minus one. So upon choosing this action a of t, the decision maker receives the reward r of t, which could be random and uh, from a distribution that typically depends on the chosen action at the current state. So the goal of decision maker is to maximize uh, the collected reward uh, over the time horizon uh, from initial time to time, time slot t. So note that in this setup, uh, the decision maker has observation that is limited to the sequence of state action pairs and reward that he has received up to any time t. And this, this is uh, the only piece of information that she gets to receive. Okay. So related to this general setup, we would like to uh, introduce some performance metrics uh, to assess the performance of the decision maker or the performance of the policy the decision maker is using. So one, uh, one good performance metric uh, is the notion of regret, which is defined as the difference between the expected cumulative reward of an optimal policy phi star and the cumulative reward generated by the policy phi that is uh, employed by the decision maker. So formally, the regret of policy or algorithm phi up to time a slot t, is that the expected reward here that, that is obtained when you would know uh, the system entirely, all the dynamics, all the reward functions, and uh, you would hence be able to compute an optimal policy. So this accumulated reward under an optimal policy, minus the reward that decision maker could accumulate under policy five. Well, uh, back to previous slide, we have said here that the goal of decision maker is to maximize the collected reward. So since the reward has randomness, and this randomness is due to uh, randomness in the distribution and randomness in the dynamics and uh, in the sample pass uh, chosen by policy. So either we look at this reward in expectation, this cumulative reward in expectation, or we would like to uh, 
guarantee that uh, the reward is greater than something with uh, high probability. So, sorry, uh, the reward is deterministic, or and it doesn't matter. It could be deterministic. It could In be general, because it could be like a function of s, the state and the action. So basically, the reward uh, in the general setup uh, is random. Okay. So independent from so, so RT. It, it is uh, it is drawn it is drawn from a distribution, and this distribution uh, would differ based on a state action pair. Right. So yeah. if you are yeah. using action a at a state mm -hmm. one, it's yeah. different. Exactly. But even if you assume that it's deterministic, which is not, uh, which is, which we can assume, mm -hmm. even if the reward is deterministic, still mm -hmm. this yeah. cumulative reward is random because yeah. uh, as soon as you choose a reward, you will be transited, you will you will be brought to mm -hmm. another state with yeah. some random dynamics. Right, right. right. Could okay. be Markovian okay. dynamics, but okay. right. then uh, yeah. randomization comes in. Right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, well, uh, there is a random. This this would be a random variable, and uh, one uh, one goal. Uh, this is pretty big goal. We can say yeah. yeah, well, just maximize the collected reward in expectation, and to this end, uh, maximizing this quantity amounts to minimizing this quantity because this is fixed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this expectation fixed because pi star is fixed, and then. Uh, Either you minimize the regret or you maximize the expected cumulative reward. Yeah. So uh, this definition of regret door here uh, uh, if you look uh, more carefully uh, there is uh, some trade-off that should be uh, should be taken into account uh, and this is a trade-off when minimizing when minimizing the regret, this is a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Basically, uh, after gathering some information, you could uh, you could make, for example, an empirical model of the system, and based on that empirical model, you can choose an action which is uh, optimal in this empirical model. So this amounts to at each time you should decide whether to collect the best action given the experience so far, or rather to explore another action to learn the environment better and in the end, uh, in turn, to, 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 to guide this exploration towards identifying better action at various states. So at each, each time, basically any algorithm pi uh, should implement uh, some balancing between this uh, exploration or exploitation, and uh, if you do not uh, hold this balance uh, appropriately, and if in particular if you do not control the rate of exploration uh, uh, in a rigorous way, then you may end up uh, with large regret mm -hmm. or with uh, better regret, larger regret. Yeah, and this brings us. Uh, to, to the topic of this talk, basically. <clears throat> so, in particular, we would like to see how much we can uh, decrease the regret as a function of time. To this end, uh, we would like to identify the performance limits that uh, that could be achievable uh, by any policy pi and those that cannot be beaten, in, in the sense that uh, if you have an optimal algorithm, uh, what would be lower bound than the regret that you cannot basically beat? Okay. So the previous online decision making setup is very general. And uh, in the SQL, we would like to consider two specific sequential decision making problems. The first one is multi arm bandit in the stochastic setting. And the second one is uh, the more general class of reinforcement learning, but in a sense, these two are limited uh, when you consider the general decision making setup. So the first one to start with is the stochastic multi arm bandit. And the model, uh, in line with what we, pre we presented so far, is a set of k arms or k distributions where each arm a is associated with a probability distribution nu of a, whose mean is mu of a. 
And when you select an arm A, this leads to observing a realization from this distribution. So there is no notion of state, or just uh, the state space in this problem is just a singleton. So you need not uh, worry about like transiting to a different state. There is just notion of action, or what we call here R. In the classical setting, arms are assumed to be independent. And moreover, the realization uh, of various samples from a given arm are in independent across time as well. This, this first assumption can be relaxed, but uh, for the moment, let's keep it. So at round T, a decision maker chooses an arm T, and then uh, upon choosing an arm T, uh, after playing this arm, basically she observes a random reward R of T, which is, uh, which is drawn from a distribution nu A of T. This is a mistake here. This is nu A of T, but the mean of this would be mu A of T. And basically, when decision maker employs a policy or algorithm to do this, uh, this A of T is chosen as a function of all the information uh, gathered so far. So, as we have seen so far, uh, all the information gathered so far is the arm plate at the first time and the corresponding reward and second time corresponding reward. And since there is no notion of a state, uh, it's a bit simpler time, simpler history than than the general setting. Of course, this policy can employ some randomization as well, but uh, in particular, it's, uh, it's a function of this entire history uh, seen here. So just review of notion of regret, it's quite similar to that. The goal of the decision maker is to maximize the sum of reward gathered under a given policy in expectation or equivalent to, to minimize the regret. So, and as we said earlier, this needs uh, for some sort of uh, trade-off between exploration and exploitation. So, let me proceed by introducing some notation because I, uh, okay, to, good, to make a good transition, we have this definition of regret for a given policy. Uh, for the problem of design, we would like to design an algorithm or a class of algorithms that uh, lead to regret bounds uh, uh, that can be shown uh, growing uh, sublinear in the first place. When the regret is sublinear, your algorithm is learning something. So, so sublinear could be, for example, t to the power of two thirds up to some constant. Could be a screw root of t, could be log t, could be a screw root of log of t. So, to have a merit to see whether uh, this rate of increase that we have for a regret on a given algorithm is good or not, or in a sense if our algorithm is uh, order optimal or not, or optimal or not, we should, uh, for a given problem, we should uh, look uh, how the regret under an optimal algorithm uh, should grow. So basically this leads us to the study of the lower bound, meaning that given a problem instance, uh, meaning that uh, giving a set of distributions that defines your bandit problem, you would like to see uh, what is the fundamental performance limit in finite term or asymptotic when p grows large uh, in either regimes that uh, you identify uh, some sort of lower bound that uh, indicate that, that the regret of the time t should be bigger than this function uh, uh, with precise constant and uh, with uh, precise depend precise as a, as a function of t. So to study uh, the lower bound... Uh, Sorry, maybe this is a very stupid question. Uh, like, uh, so the regret? So this is a positive quantity, and then we want this to decrease, so we should be interested in an upper bound, right? The regret is positive, that's true. Hmm? Uh, this is for sure. So because, shouldn't it because, be? Yeah. yeah. Shouldn't it be? Yeah. And uh, for an algorithm, when you analyze the regret, you would like to see that the regret is 
of the time t is uh, less than something which is as a function of time t. Uh -huh. And uh, this is when t is finite time. And uh, when you have notion of asymptotic regret, mm -hmm. uh, then you would like to have to show that limb of supremum of right. regret right. divided yeah. by some function of t is uh, less than something. But in order to have a merit of how good is this lower bound or how bad is this, mm -hmm. sorry, upper bound, you would like to derive lower bounds on regret. And if these lower, lower bounds on regret uh, are informative, mm -hmm. and in particular if the, these are tight, in yeah. the sense that like there are some yeah. algorithm that could achieve this, mm -hmm. then you say, okay, I achieve, for example, a regret uh, less than two s root of t, for example. Yeah. And then uh, the lower bound indicates that the regret should be bigger than uh, one half s root of t. Then you say, mm -hmm. okay, my regret has uh, optimal, uh, is order optimal. Right. It has right. the same dependence on time as the lower bound. Right, okay. But with mm -hmm. a constant that could be improved uh, by this amount, for example. Okay, okay. So in this literature, it's common to, to look at lower bounds and then look at the behavior of lower bounds. Uh, yeah, well, uh, at least for this context that we are discussing, the yeah. lower bound mm -hmm. actually uh, leads you to a design of an, an algorithm. Yeah, exactly, algorithm. exactly, yes. exactly. It's similar to like information theory, like inner bounds and yes, are more yes, informative is, uh, than outer bounds. Yeah, yeah it's because it's uh, it's defined for any problem in sense, so it could, yeah, exactly. it's not just on worst cases. So to study the lower bound, uh, basically we consider this. Uh, setup which is not actually much more limited but it, it, it sounds a bit uh, of limitation but let us assume uh, just some sort of regularity that uh, we are study a bandit problem where any distribution new that we study is uh, a parameterized distribution for example you can think of Bernoulli normal distribution all these distributions are parameterized so I assume for example uh, all my arms uh, generate reward according to normal distribution and uh, I know the shape of normal distribution, right? But I, I as a decision maker, do not know what is uh, variance and, for example, the mean. So we assume further that there is a parameter theta that even if the decision maker may know the form of mu, she doesn't know theta and the whole distribution is therefore is uh, unknown to her. And... Uh, Yes, this is a uh, parametric distribution, right? Uh, there is an optimal R, A star, which uh, has the highest mean reward. Well, note that this mu A is as a function of theta as well. Let us use this uh, mu A star as a shorthand for mu of A star. Just as, as a review to this, not as an overview to this notation, uh, recall that uh, we consider an online policy pi, uh, a rule that selects uh, the arm of time t under this policy, which is denoted by superscript pi, which is a, which uh, takes as an input uh, all the observations received so far, and an a of t under policy pi is the number of the arms of arm a under policy pi. This is a. Okay, now we have this definition of regret in the previous slides, but we can show that given uh, these uh, notations, basically the regret can be written like this. So it's, it's quite easy to show that uh, this regret, this regret is easily, uh, can be easily written as this. The number of times uh, a suboptimal A is chosen under policy pi up to uh, time as well capital T time the gap, suboptimality gap of this arm and you should sum this contribution to regret for all of suboptimal arms so this is uh, uh, with this notation we would like to study uh, regret lower bounds uh, So basically, if we consider the set of all possible policies, uh, we may not be able to do this. And uh, that's why we introduce some regularity assumption 
by de defining the notion of uh, uniformly good policies or uniformly good algorithms. In the literature, it is uh, also referred as consistent policies or consistent algorithms. And you can uh, think of like uh, similar regularity assumptions in information theoretic uh, context as well. So an algorithm or policy phi is called uniformly good if for all parameters theta and for any suboptimal arm A, the number of times uh, an A of T that you select arm A up to time T under this algorithm uh, is uh, growing uh, as little O of T to the power of alpha for all alpha to the power positive alpha. So for example, uh, if an algorithm plays any arm for any parameter logarithmic number of time, it satisfies this, it is uniformly good. So why we need this assumption? It is because if we state the lower bound without restricting to this class of policies, there is a risk that there is an algorithm that for some parameter theta, uh, it, uh, it plays, for example, a norm a finite number of times, but it may not lead uh, this for all parameter theta. And this all parameter theta is uh, the thing beyond this definition. So we would like to obtain this rubber bond that holds for all you know, these parameters, not just for a specific parameters that uh, could serve our purpose. So the first lower bound reported in the literature for this uh, bandit problem uh, stochastic bandit problem is the one by Loy and Robbins in 1985, uh, which was a breakthrough uh, result uh, in this field since the invention of uh, bandit problem in 1952 by Robbins himself. So, for simplicity, let us consider the case of Bernoulli distributions. So, a Bernoulli distribution is a parametric distribution where basically the parameter is the success probability theta denoted by theta. This means that uh, the, new, the distribution nu A of uh, theta is fully determined by this success probability theta. And further note that the parameter lies in the interval 0 and 1 because it's success probability. And further, mu A, which is a function of theta, it's the theta itself. Right? So this is uh, Loy and Robbins lower bound. For any uniformly good algorithm, and although not written here for any parameter theta, uh, if arm A is suboptimal, meaning that uh, the success probability of uh, arm A is less than the maximum success probability among all the arms, if A is suboptimal, then uh, an algorithm pi, any online algorithm pi, should uh, basically uh, uh, satisfy this, this, this identity, this inequality for the number of draws that it draws uh, arm A up to time t. This says that basically, asymptotically, uh, any suboptimal arm A up to time t should, should be uh, at least log t divided by kl distribution between uh, theta a and uh, theta a star, where this kl is Bernoulli divergence, or relative entropy, if we call it in information theory. And there is no algorithm that would have, uh, uh, would have uh, basically uh, a number of arms of a suboptimal, uh, the number of the arms of suboptimal arm up to time t less than this amount. So in view of uh, the previous definition of regret, this uh, simplified definition, simply the, re the lower bound of regret and asymptotic lower bound of regret can be uh, derived as this. The contribution to regret over all suboptimal arms, where for each arm a, uh, the contribution of regret is the gap of this arm when compared to optimal arm divided by this k divergence.
Yes. Uh, in the first line, you say that theta a should be less than theta a star, but in the last line, I can't see this. Well, this summation is basically due over all on a, where uh, theta a is less than theta a star. Basically, you can remove this. This is just for the case that you have multiple optimal arms. You can remove this, and instead you can write if a is not equal to a star. Because when a is equal to a star, this scale would be zero. Uh, so uh, there could be some intuition uh, uh, derived from this uh, regret upper bound, regret lower bound. Well, it says. Uh, uh, the closer theta i theta a is uh, to theta a star, basically this kl would be smaller, and this quantity would be bigger, and uh, uh, any algorithm pi should uh, select this arm a, where theta a is closer to theta a star than any other arm, much more. But how much more is very important. So first of all, uh, it doesn't matter how much you are close to optimal arm or not. You have to delay any suboptimal arm, uh, something multiplied by log of t. And let me mention that this is a tight lower bound, in a sense that there is an, an algorithm, which we call it an optimal algorithm, despite being complex, can achieve this bound. And although this is asymptotic, this algorithm may enjoy a uh, finite sample Regret upper bound as well. And uh, such an algorithm has been uh, introduced in the literature in like 2010 or 2011. Uh, yes? I should have asked this before, but uh, in this model, uh, what is the next state? There is no notion of state. This is a okay. bandit model. Uh, uh, basically, you only have one state. You only have one state and you do not leave this state. Your state space is a single one. And oh. then that's why we call it this low motion. And the sample much not like this in this model, they are IAT. Yeah. yeah, it's much simpler word than that of uh, Markov distance processes. Or it's just a Markov distance yeah. process where you have one state and that state has uh, K arms or K actions. So it's interesting that uh, uh, basically uh, the KL divergence uh, in view of thin scaling inequalities and uh, like uh, upper and lower bounds for uh, uh, KL in the bare middle case that we know is that this KL is more or less proportional to theta a minus theta a star to the power of two, right? In order. Mm -hmm. Uh, then it means uh, then it means that uh, the closer theta if, if there are two suboptimal arms the one that is closer to optimal arm should be played more and yeah but how much more this this how much more uh, is inversely proportional to the square distance between these two right so in the end in the end the contribution of regret for the arm that is uh, Suboptimal is defined by two things. The gap is the gap, right? And this thing in the denominator. So the gap uh, is this, and this thing in the denominator, uh, in view of thin scale inequality and related inequalities, uh, is as a, is uh, is proportional to theta a minus theta a star to the power of two. So in the end we see that the relative contribution of regret for those arms that are closer to optimal arms uh, are more. So this is a bit counterintuitive because if you, if you do not know this, and if I give you two, uh, if I give you a bandit problem where there is an, an arm which is uh, epsilon, uh, which gives a success probability smaller than epsilon with this one, uh, so intuitively, intuitively, the one that is very close to the optimal arm, uh, if you play that, if you confuse it with the optimal arm, 
it should not be much problem, right? Because uh, anyway, it gives uh, as high reward as the optimal or almost. But the thing is that uh, if we look at the regret, which is a very precise and uh, finer uh, measure of performance, it says our problem in the end for learning would, would be for those arms that are very close to the optimal arm because these arms are very hard to identify. And in the end, those, are, those arms that have bigger gaps would be identified much faster and you do not play them much. Yeah. So you do not play them much and you go towards the optimal arm. Whereas those that are very close to the optimal arm, you would, you would play a lot, and because of playing a lot, you would uh, incur a lot of regret due, due to that. Right, okay. So this is, uh, okay. yeah. this is a bit uh, counterintuitive. Okay, any question yeah. for this? Well, this, uh, this version uh, is restricted version of line robins in the original paper 1955. And restricted in the case that we just considered uh, Bernoulli distribution, but the actual proof and the actual theorem falls for uh, any distribution that can be parameterized by a single parameter. So it could be, for example, a normal distribution where, for example, you know the variance, but you don't know the mean, or vice versa. There should be some mm -hmm. real parameter that is unknown. Yeah. So it's not just limited to Bernoulli. And well, when it's not uh, Bernoulli, this scale divergence would be uh, would not be this relative entropy. Rather, it would be the uh, KL divergence uh, between the two distributions of the arm mm -hmm. A and the optimal arm. So as I mentioned, uh, the result in the previous slide uh, is actually works for any distribution that can be parameterized by a single real parameter. So where basically your parameter theta for a given arm belongs uh, to like uh, an interval or subset of arm. Right? Yeah. An extension of this result in the literature appears in Burnatas and Katakis uh, around 10 years later. Where basically uh, they bring a generalization uh, to a larger class of parametric distribution, where basically your distribution can uh, can be parameterized by multiple parameters. So now that we have a stated Lyon Robbins result, we can easily uh, mention this result. But let us first. Uh, Introduce this identifiable class of distributions. A class calligraphy P of distributions is, is called identifiable if, if for any distinct any pair of distinct distributions, mu and mu prime, the K divergence between mu and mu prime is finite. So this is sort of identifiability assumption. So under this assumption, we have this from Munetos and Katakis. For any uniformly good algorithm, pi, and for any identifiable class of distributions for which the optimal arm is unique, then if arm A is suboptimal, then uh, this lower bound holds. Asymptotically, the number of draws of arm A in expectation divided by log T should be bigger than uh, quantity K inf as a function of uh, nu A and nu star, where this K inf is the infimum of K divergence, where P is some true distribution, here the distribution of arm A, and Q is any distribution that, that could make you confused. That is, any feasible distribution which can yield a reward uh, bigger uh, than the optimal arm. So basically, this k inf is nothing, just minimum or infimum over all KL divergences between distribution nu A of arm A and any other distribution uh, which does better than the optimal arm.
So the proof that appeared in the Buna uh, Tasca type case, as well as the, as well as the proof of Lyon Robbins, uh, uh, rely on this so-called uh, change of measure argument, which is very nice technique, and uh, we do it here on board. So basically, the proof of these guys uh, follows uh, from the ideas uh, originally established by Lyon Robbins, but uh, since uh, now a lot of people have studied this problem, uh, at least uh, in the paper by Kaufman et al. in General Machine Learning Research 2016, you can uh, look the simplified proof of uh, this theorem, which also gives the simplified proof of uh, Lyon Robbins as well. So, uh, this is a two part lecture or presentation and uh, uh, what we would like to see is that uh, uh, if, any, if, if any of these ideas could carry over the case of reinforcement learning where you have a notion of a state or mm -hmm. typically where you have a Markov decision process whose reward function and transition kernel is unknown and for which we can define a similar notion of regret and we can study uh, similar performance limits and we can see that these powerful techniques uh, with a simple modification would carry over uh, reinforcement learning in MDPs and would specify uh, what would be the difficulty of reinforcement learning in hypothesis processes. So, thank you for your attention. If you have uh, questions, just uh, send me an email. Uh, it means I can't be asked question now. <laughs> you can ask. <laughs> Okay, uh, one thing, um, what would happen if we cannot parameterize the distributions for the arms? So we need, the only thing that does matter as far as I can see is just the expectation of the reward there because if you know the expectation of the best arm then you would go for that. Of course the underlying assumption is that those distributions are stationary so they are not changing. Um, and we only need to know the expectation of that. Yeah, well, if you look at the result by Boon and Tascatakis, it doesn't say much about this parameterization. Right? It just says uh, it, it, should, uh, it should be identifiable in the sense that uh, the KL divergence uh, between any pair of distribution should be finite within this class. So, uh, so we just refer to this as a class of distributions. We forget about parameters, right? It's it's. Uh, if you look at the proof of uh, this result, or maybe in Kaufman's paper, uh, you just should look at uh, the likelihood measure, uh, mm -hmm. uh, likelihood ratio, and then uh, basically this uh, this kind of uh, condition shows up. I mean, it should be. It Proof of steps relies on finiteness of this, of this scale divergence. So this parameterization is not uh, maybe as restrictive as uh, that that you may think that it should be, for example, one parameter exponential family or whatever. Of course, when it comes to analysis of an algorithm for class of bandit problem, if you don't know what is, if it is parameterized or not, that's yeah. a different story because uh, it's yeah. something else. But if you know, for example, it's parametric distribution, it's normal distribution, then uh, uh, to formulate confidence bounds, you can uh, use this knowledge. Mm -hmm. Although you don't know the parameter, but you know like shape mm -hmm. of distribution, that helps a lot. But even if you do not know that, uh, you just rely on these kind of things. For example, if you know your distribution is Bernoulli, you can do something. Yeah. But if I tell you your distribution is not necessarily Bernoulli, it's just uh, uh, some distribution with bounded support, almost surely. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, well, uh, as for the guarantee of algorithm, we have a different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. Even, if, yeah. even in this case, we can uh, use the algorithms that are optimal in the class of Bernoulli, but it may not be, it may not be optimal in that class of distribution because Definitely, definitely, then, then regret yeah. wouldn't hold anymore. Right. Yeah. But uh, yeah. the thing is that, well, mm -hmm. first of all, is the notion of the regret, but if you 
go back if we go back to the first result of Larry and Robin, it's, it has nothing about the regret, right? So the regret comes to the second second um, result, I would say. And the first result is just about the number of times that suboptimal yeah. armor being played. That's it. Uh, but yes. the, mm -hmm. the problem is that since it's asymptotic, I'm not sure if we can say anything about non-asymptotic scenario, non-asymptotic number of plays, uh, number of times that any arm has been played and can be ordered them based on um, being close to the optimal or not. Uh, right. So, you see, you see just one yeah. thing, uh, so if you look at the algorithms, mm -hmm. they are algorithms that achieve this bound non-asymptotically. So even if this is asymptotic result, uh, it says asymptotically false, it doesn't it does not imply that uh, for finite time this can this may hold yeah. uh, up to second order term. It says nothing more than that. But when you come to algorithms, there are algorithms where for <coughs> any parameter or any class of bandit, uh, not only the limb soup, but also just this expected value is less than this multiplied by low t mm -hmm. plus some terms. That's the that problem. are sublogarithmic. Yes, but that's the problem. The thing is that uh, if we have some constant uh, that says that, okay, this, the number of times that some arm has been played, some suboptimal arm has been played, is less than, now it should be the upper bound on that. So it's less than something uh, for suboptimal arm 1, and it's less than something for suboptimal arm 2. So a general formula for suboptimal arm A is like that. Then is it possible to say because then the constant plays wrong? Why? Because well, we want to say that for sure or with some with some probabilities, mm -hmm. suboptimal arm one will be played less than suboptimal arm two if the KL distance between one mm -hmm. and ah yes is yes less than two okay and okay two. this has something to do uh, ordering yeah. up the suboptimal yeah arm. actually it has something to do with the notion of fairness in bandits there are uh, there is a uh, there is a recent paper, I think NIPS 2016, where uh, it defines the notion of fairness as follows. It says, consider this bandit problem as classical bandit problem. The optimal arm is uh, as this, mm -hmm. the one with the highest uh, average reward. Yet, I would like to uh, come up with an algorithm that satisfies, that not only, for example, approaches this limit, but also it satisfies the following fairness property or constraints. Mm -hmm. If the average reward of suboptimal arm A is greater than the average reward of suboptimal arm A prime. The algorithm should play arm A more than it plays the optimal A prime with high probability. And with high probability means that uh, you have a notion of probability delta and uh, whatever guarantee you have. For, for any so it says basically A's if A's. Uh, it says if uh, mu is mu a is greater than mu a star, then uh, uh, an a of t under pi should be greater than an a prime uh, with, high, with probability, for example, greater than uh, 1 minus delta. The one thing a star this is not the optimal, right? Pardon? A and a star, they Sorry, are two a different prime. This is a prime. Mm -hmm. okay. this is a prime. This is for arms. any pair of suboptimal mm -hmm. arms, and in particular, of course, uh, one could be optimal. Yeah. But it, mm -hmm. would, it, it is not, not only for the optimal, so it's sort, sort mm -hmm. of constraints. And uh, the results that we have here for this class of things mm -hmm. is not as, as informative or yeah. as, uh, uh, yeah. as concrete as this, but uh, probably there is a way to use these techniques here. Also. Mm -hmm. So there is a... Uh, so I may refer to a NIPS 2016 paper by uh, some people that I think they were at UPenn, mm -hmm. Michael Kerr. So one thing, so this, this framework automatically would not imply that notion of now. So, so first of all, what you have here is with high probability yeah. and probably it holds, uh, it can be converted to expected regret, but uh, I'm not sure what you achieve here as for lower bound, uh, could be as powerful uh, as this problem is specific or okay. uh, because this is a problem dependent. It's suppose that any any yeah. like kind of regular problem instance you give, I give the lower one for your problem. Whereas uh, for this kind of things, the lower bound 
I'm not talking about yeah. Android, but the lower bound, mm -hmm. mostly rely on uh, you know construction of the minimax problem. Mm -hmm. uh, say uh, in the minimax mm -hmm. setting, the regret should be bigger than this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or not, not only the regret. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a restricted class of policies. Uh, and uh, the regret for this should be bigger than the regret mm -hmm. for here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but how big? Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, if it's uh, if it's done or not. Basically, there is a framework in reinforcement learning called Quick, K W I K, which is a framework uh, for like uh, like design of algorithms based on the principle that knows what it knows. Quick. Mm -hmm. The acronym is quick. And then uh, the algorithm uh, that satisfies this kind of guarantee relies on this uh, uh, quick framework. And if you. So basically, it's application of some, some, some framework in, to multi armanded problem and to, to, to basically result in this kind of like, uh, uh, guarantee. So could be good to look at it and not. Yeah. Uh, I'm not very aware of the details of the algorithm, but, uh, but it could be of interest in some applications. Mm -hmm. There could be other notions that I may not know. Uh, well, because uh, at least another work that I know has something to do with uh, trading, uh, like uh, uh, performance, and uh, an error in this bandit setup. So there are other related papers, but the closest that comes to my mind is this. It gives that with high probability, or you can think of it as in expectation. In expectation, you should uh, you should end up with uh, like, uh, maybe in expectation is No, that's okay trivial, with expectation. But I think no, it's expect yeah, exactly. No, the thing that's is that okay. uh, yeah. we can use but this inequality to move that uh, expectation. That's okay. Um, because the expectation is already what already held here. Because this, mm -hmm. if if uh, if there is another arm, yeah. Well, maybe I should have answered the question maybe from this argument that if theta a is less than theta a prime, and a and mm -hmm. a prime are two suboptimal arms, definitely. Uh, the lower bound for arm A is something, and the lower bound for arm A prime is bigger mm -hmm. because of this uh, monotonicity of KL divergence. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. But as for the algorithm, whether the algorithm satisfies this, because uh, the upper bound for the algorithm may satisfy this, but you would like to. No, actually, the lower like bound wouldn't be helpful. Why? Because the lower bound says that the number of times that this guy will be played. Would be larger than something, but it's achievable. Uh, yes, so it's tight. It's tight. Yeah, yeah. The, the achievability is based on the upper bound. Actually, you can think of it for uh, for some algorithm as to be equal. No, no, I totally agree with that. But uh, I'm just saying that that equality, that achievability, everything comes from the upper bound. So if we have some algorithm that provides the upper bound similar to this, then we say that okay, now this is achievable. And we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally agree with that. No, I'm just saying that that's why that we should look at the upper bound. So the upper bound is the most important thing here, I would say, not the lower bound. Why? Um, in, in the in the setting that I'm saying, actually, for my yes, yes. because the, what the lower bound says, it says that the number of times that arm A will be played will be larger than something, let's say larger than 10, for instance, the number of the average number of 10 log T, of course. And then the number of times that arm A prime will be played will be 20 log T, but it doesn't mean that arm one would not be played more than arm two simply because both of them are larger than 10 log t, of course. Yes. Um, but then if you have an upper, uh, an upper bound, then we can say for sure that the number of times that this guy will be played is less than the number of times that this guy will be played. Uh, so this is something that can be... Uh, but I totally agree with, with your argument that if this bound is achievable, yeah. then it means that there are some algorithms yes. that provide that So, so for expectation, it's not a problem, but uh, really when you implement an algorithm, even if the expectation uh, that arm A, a given arm, suboptimal arm A, is played, mm -hmm. and then uh, you pack them with this 
with this formula and you derive mm -hmm. the regret. Yes, so, yes, yes, yes. But, but that's regret so, analysis. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's why I'm telling. Uh, if it's expect expectation, it's already there. Yeah, but I'm not talking about the regret. So regret is not important at all. The only thing that is important is just the number of times that someone from our will play. That's it. Um, of yeah, course. And, and then, uh, of course, yeah, and then uh, when you have this uh, bound on this, uh, the bound, it's a bound on this. So, uh, of course, it would be big uh, because of uh, or, as as a matter of artifact of the proof. I mean, mm -hmm. it could be big. Because right. you may not yeah. be careful in the analysis, could be. But at least maybe this says something. Uh, this is the closest work actually that gives uh, that that puts some constraints on the policy uh, mm -hmm. in favor of mm -hmm. some fairness constraint, as they call it. And it's it's fairness actually because it says uh, this is fair that is on almost suboptimal because it's less. Less suboptimal to be played more than this more suboptimal one. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but maybe it's not so simple to modify to, to fit your. It's not straightforward to me how you make this fit into what you had in mind, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can start again. Like, I mean, if you want to try to answer the question, probably go for the question direct, which is exactly like try to see what is the optimal. I mean, uh, like how many times does an arm get played and then you could rank them actually without like having starting from that direction yes that, but, yeah. but then that depends on actual the actual objective function so the actual objective function is not the number of times that individual right. arm no, you could play. Play. yeah exactly the actual objective is a regret and if the actual function is act only the regret mm -hmm. then we may not be able to say then then the, the next um, slide would be the number of times that individual arm will be played so if we now change the regret or if we allow some some deviation from that optimal solution then we may we might be able to go for some something like this algorithm that provide this mm -hmm. form of fairness what I'm saying is yeah. that is it possible to go even for something even more stricter mm -hmm. set of policies where they might have some more epsilon compared to this mm -hmm. regret, but at the end of the day, they you can instead of just saying that number of times that a one will be played will be just more than number of times that a two will be played. You just say that the number of times that a one will be played will be within this bound of the number of times that a star will be mm -hmm. played, and a two will be again. Mm -hmm. So at the end of yeah. the day, let's say three best arms will be played much much mm -hmm. more. Than other arms, um, and then you do just don't care about the fourth best arm. That's it. So this is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, here, what it says yeah, that well, we can have a lot of constraints. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. We yes. can have. Yeah, uh, but that's what I'm saying. Just curiosity. Yeah. Just, yeah, exactly. So yeah, even this that I mentioned is very recent paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2016, not very recent, but like one and a half year old. The that's results. pretty recent. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> recent, and then. Uh, uh, yeah, if we rely on this result, then uh, not many people probably have thought about it. And uh, so, yeah, if you look at the machinery of the proof for this kind of algorithm, then it may indicate mm -hmm. how hard it could be mm -hmm. uh, to go for further constraints mm -hmm. or what kind yeah. of constraints we can really achieve. Okay, yeah. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's